Face here back with another reaction video. This time I'm reacting to History of N Nadeo, I think it's pronounced, 454, uh, Collapse of the Hunnic Empire, The Scourge of God is No More by History March. Now, I have already reacted to three videos that that's, that's uh, sort of on the subject of Attila the Hun in a way. I think one was from Kings and Generals, and the other two were from History March themselves. And, um... And, uh... And I might have already said in those videos that, um... To my shame, in a way, the... Sorry about that, I'll just suggest that. That my knowledge of the Huns is based off the game Age of Empires 2. So... If if you, I don't know how accurate the history stories are from Age of Empires too, but that's sort of where I got my enthusiasm from history. So I'm not really a historian; I'm just a bit of a history enthusiast, among other things. So um, so the usual disclaimer when I react to anything historical: if I don't show so much what is considered a proper reaction is probably obvious I don't know much about the subject at hand and if I do know anything I'll mostly um, pause the video to give my input or ask any curious questions which hopefully will be in the comments with that being said the link to the original video will be in the description down below please go and subscribe to History March and uh, please check out their channel and support them because I think they're Along with a few others, they're one of the one of the best history channels on YouTube. Among, as I said, among among a few others I can name, but but I think, but anyway, that's by the by. So um, so uh, yeah. So the link to the original will be in the. Oh yeah, I already said that. Uh, God, sorry, brain fart. So I've said what I've had said. So um, I'll just uh, full screen that, get that up on there, and uh, make sure subtitles are on because this um, this uh, historical video. So um, yeah, for the first few seconds, uh, it's based after Attila's death. So. Following the death of Attila the Hun, flame and turmoil engulfed the ghostly remains of the imperial frontier along the Rhine and Danube rivers. Without a prominent warlord at the helm, the network of tribes under Hunnic rule began to fracture. By early 454, from the Hunnic Carpathian base, Attila's eldest son... Yeah, for the most part, Huns... For, even though they had an empire, they were not known for capturing cities and towns. From what I remember learning, in my own way, that they just looted, raided, burned, killed people, and uh, took all all they uh, could take with them back to their camps. Their last main camp was known to be somewhere on the Danube River Valley, from what I remember. But again, I could be wrong, so... Oh, why does it keep doing that? Okay. And Alak makes it plain to the breakaway tribes that Just he is now in this. command of his father's empire, mm. demanding their submission. But as the snows melted, and the Hunnic grazing fields came to life under the warm spring sun, Attila's trusted former lieutenants stirred. Mm. Valamir of the Ostrogoths and Arderic of the Gepids announced they are now the leaders of free peoples and will no longer obey the commands of Alak or his brothers. Unable to let this challenge go unpunished, Alak moves with his remaining forces at a startling speed, directly at the heart of the rebel tribes. In an epic ride reminiscent of his father, who in his heyday could appear out of nowhere like a storm with his riders, 
Alak does not stop until he has crossed the Danube, the noise of fire and shrieking of captives echoing behind him. Uh -huh. Now in what was once Roman Pannonia, he reaches the Sava River and rides along it until his scouts report that there is a force on a tributary called the Nadal. Yep. It is Arderic, and he has brought an allied army of tribes, willing to risk it all to throw off the yoke of the power-hungry sons of Attila. Thick rain clouds loom over the plain, blackening the day. Only the occasional flashes of lightning briefly reveal the armies assembling in the rain. Imagine seeing that. That's got to be one hell of a sight. You don't see the opposite end of the field, but only see glimpses in lightning in a flash of lightning. That must be a bit of an, uh, a visual morale morale hit after seeing that. Arderic greets Alak on the river plain with a long shield wall, the full extent of his force concealed behind it. Sorry to stop it so quickly, but also he's got some other natural defenses as well. He's got a thick forest to your left, which hopefully is thick enough, and a river on his right, and these like uh, ponds or lakes in bo on either side of his flanks, which hopefully might provide some defense. The Gepids remain again. I'm not an expert. I'm just guess. I'm just looking, seeing what I'm seeing here. Remain in place as the Huns deploy before them, watching silently from behind the guards of their helmets. Elak knows Arderic, the Gepid king, who was a great commander and one of his father's closest counselors. Mm -hmm. But Elak carries the blood of Attila, the mm. scourge of God, in his veins. That blood now begins to pump, Alak's heart beating like a war drum. Mm. Destroy Arderic, and Attila's empire will come together once more. Raising his sword to the sky, he screams the war cry that signals the order to attack. Thousands of his men ride forward into the line of silent and unmoving gepids. Mm -hmm. Arrows fill the air over their heads as the whirlwind of Hunnic riders come close to loosen their arrows before retreating. Thunder, lightning, rain, the ground shakes with the thrum of hooves. The field churns into mud that soon mixes with the blood of the fallen. Cracks appeared in the rebel line. Howling the same petrifying scream as their leader, the Huns unleash the last volley mid-gallop before drawing lances, swords, nets, and ropes. They are going to round up and butcher the rebels like cattle. Their horses crumple into the line, and battle is joined up and down the plain. For a moment, the fate of the world hangs in the balance. As oh, a fan of history, I enjoy games that do a good job of presenting the time period they are set in. So it's with pleasure that I welcome back just such a sponsor, mm -hmm. War Thunder. It's the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, where you can play with more than 2,000 tanks, planes, ha The bonus pack is available Feel for a limited free to check time only, out. so don't wait. See you on the battlefield Feel in War Thunder. Feel free to check Thunder. them out if you're interested. Many will know that these were years of instability, violence, and war. This was the time of the Huns, whose realm came to loom over the Roman empires of East and West like a dark cloud, ever ready to unleash its mounted hordes into the heart of the Imperium and obliterating the very framework of civilization. It appeared that Hunnic presence was established with an unshakable permanence. But in 451, Attila had seen his first defeat at the hands of General Aetius in the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, which I covered extensively in a separate video. Yep. A link to that will be in the description. 
which is uh, two of the videos that I've reacted to about the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, which are on my channel. If you want to see my reaction to that, feel free to go onto my channel and search for them. There is a search bar that will help you find them quicker, so if you want to check them out, feel free. A year later, in 452, Attila invaded Italy. Mm -hmm. Catching Aetius and the weak Emperor Valentinian III by surprise, he came within a hair's breadth of capturing Rome. But the two massive campaigns had depleted Attila's forces and put him on a war footing against the West. He could no longer count on bribes, tributes and subsidies that were a vital source of funds. But a plague in Italy caused a massive famine, depriving the Huns of the plunder they expected to collect and offering insufficient food reserves they could carry off to use over the winter months. Attila had no choice but to accept a nominal bribe from the Western Empire to retreat, his army suffering terribly to attrition. Meanwhile, a new emperor ascended the throne in Constantinople two years earlier. Marcion, the tall and unusually warlike emperor of the East, had forsworn the annual tribute to Attila during his rampage through Gaul and mm. Italy in 451 and 452, further depriving the Hunnic leader of invaluable subsidies needed to maintain the massive tribal war machine. Not only that, Marcion had taken the war to the Huns. In mid-452, he led an army into the Pannonian Plain. Despite the threat of punitive raids, the Eastern Roman Emperor ventured into the plains where he defeated a Hunnic army. Marcion then struck Attila where it hurts the most. He devastated the lands of the Ostrogoths, the breadbasket of the Hunnic domain. The loss of food supplies would have put more pressure on Attila, whose expedition into Italy had already fell short of expectations. Marcion proceeded into the lands of the Gepids, who, alongside the Ostrogoths, were most opposed to Hunnic rule. The Roman Emperor understood that the ravaging of the lands of the Germanic tribes would undermine Attila's authority. Mm -hmm. Crops were burned, food stores plundered, villages and strongholds razed. Marcion's campaign of 452 was a vintage Roman maneuver, reminiscent of Tiberius and Germanicus's drive into Germania in the wake of the disaster at Teutoburg to destroy and despoil the home soil of the enemy mm. and retreat before they could be pinned down. News of Marcion's incursion must have been a shock to Attila. But more importantly, it reminded the tribes along the Danube of the power of Rome. Finally, Marcion recrossed the Danube in early autumn. By November 452, Attila had returned and was marching to his winter quarters somewhere on the Pannonian Plain. He dispatched messages to Constantinople, threatening with invasion and conquest of the Eastern wow. Empire the following spring, unless outstanding tribute was paid. Mm. But Marcion ignored the threats, reasoning that Roman gold would be better spent training and arming the legions. As early as January 453, Attila's preparations for a large-scale invasion began. However, his aura of invincibility mm -hmm. lost some of its terrifying potency. Assembling the troops and provisions for the campaign had not gone as smoothly as it had in years past. Nevertheless, he still commanded enough respect among the subjugated tribes to field a host capable of outmatching the Roman field army. But the fateful campaign would not come to fruition. Attila died unexpectedly mm. after celebrating a marriage to one of his many wives. Which his death was still disputed, if I remember rightly. Some people say that he was poisoned by his last wife. Or he had a nosebleed and choked to death. As again, it's still debatable, so um, feel free to... Feel free to... 
to add your not your information to the comments about that situation. The Hunnic leadership mm. was shaken. Those in the upper echelons of power realized that the dead warlord's throne now carried an untold level of reward and prestige. The crows were well and truly circling. To move against Attila would have been tantamount to suicide and the elimination of one's entire family line. But Attila's heirs were not so unassailable, lacking the chilling reputation of their father. Mm -hmm. And with the great Hun now gone, new possibilities opened in the minds of Attila's previously loyal lieutenants. The most capable of these generals was likely Arderic, leader of the Gepids, a man possessing intelligence and wisdom that Attila likened to his own. There was also Valamir of the Ostrogoths, who was of more noble lineage than Attila, mm -hmm. shrewd and crafty in diplomacy and intelligence gathering. Both chieftains had accompanied Attila at the Catalonian plains and remained in his host until his demise. Both of them would have suffered from Marcian's raid, and likely they were ambitious themselves to see what kingdoms they could carve out yeah. in the unstable Hunnic domain or within Roman borders. By spring 453, reports that the scourge of God was no more reached Constantinople wow. and Italy, no doubt to the relief of the Roman leadership. Mm -hmm. Further afield, once Attila's death became known, the news was received as a clarion of hope by many tribes that were compelled to fight wow. under his banner. The Hunnic mm. horde fragmented, but the first conflict in the wake of Attila's death was between his sons. It is okay. likely that Attila had dozens if not hundreds of children, but the names of only three of these have come down to us since antiquity. They were Alak, Dengizic, and Ernak. Like their forefathers, Ernak and Dengizic were willing to rule alongside one another, mm. but Alak did not possess the gift of compromise needed mm. to succeed in the tribal ruling structure. The draw of ruling alone like his father and extend his influence over the tribes and the Roman world must have been the sweetest temptation. Thus, each brother formed their own power base mm. within the Hunnic Empire. From the turmoil, Elak emerged the most powerful, but he failed to win over or coerce his father's wow. generals to his side. He was too powerful for them to defeat, but also not forceful enough to both attract and compel the allies necessary to bludgeon the imperial lands of Rome. The Ostrogoths were the first of the allied tribes to rebel, rising up in late 453 or early 454. Refusing to pay tribute, Valamir even attacked Hunnic lands in the Tais Valley. The Ostrogoths were numerous and warlike, no match for the Huns under Attila, but with the Hunnic realm fragmented between the three brothers, the opportunity was mm -hmm. there for the taking. Alak must have tried to cobble together his father's confederation and rally the Hunnic forces to meet the Ostrogoths, either destroying them as a force or chastening them back into the fold. But Arderic refused the order and made known his own intentions to operate as an independent sovereign. The Gepid leader was enraged by the brothers trading free tribes and lands like livestock, which made them worse than the Romans in his eyes. The Gepids were now in rebellion. Mm. Not possessing the numbers to confront the Huns head-on, Arderic retreated west to join forces with other Germanic tribes, and perhaps hoping to get Valamir to his side. Alak went after Arderic's main army. Mm. He had the option of overrunning the undefended Gepid lands, but this would not have forced their submission, nor restored his own prestige. Alak had no alternative but to meet the rebels in the field mm. or lose his authority and with it the legitimacy yeah. to rule. Even though Attila got his authority after killing his brother Bleda.
On the day of the battle, sources differ over the precise makeup of the armies, though it is almost certain that Alak could only muster his own Huns and the Alans, the yeah. first of the Western peoples to fall under the Hunnic dominion, and probably the Shiri, an East Germanic people known for their effective infantry auxiliaries. Arderic may have been supported by Valamir's Ostrogoths, but that is far from certain. Mm. It is most often told that he commanded a Germanic force including his own Gepids, Heruli, Rugil, and Zuebi, mm. as well as some Shiri. Whatever the case, Alak drew the first move, eager to teach Arderic a lesson. His mounted Huns and Alans led the attack, relying on the composite bow, while the Shiri moved on foot in support. When the battle was joined, the struggle on the field of Nidau was an epic clash. With terrifying coordination, the Huns came cl Again, sorry for mispronouncing Nidau. ...close to unleash their volleys before circling round to the back mm -hmm. to repeat the maneuver. Arderic arrayed his men behind a shield wall. He was intimately familiar with the tactics and commanders yeah. of his enemy's host. He would have been present at the Catalonian plains and seen how the Romans and Visigoths withstood the Hunnic attacks behind their shield wall and waited to make their own counter charge. As the Huns chipped away at the Germanic line, Arderic's men stood their ground. The men behind the first line launched missile weapons at the incoming Huns, including javelins and spears. Throwing axes were used by some of the Germanic tribal warriors. The men in the front were equipped with short blades to ward off the Hunnic tactic of lassoing opponents and dragging them from the line to their deaths. Arderic would have relayed messages to his captains to urge their men to hold firm assuring them that their moment will come. Wave after wave of Hunnic riders came in, mm -hmm. a seemingly unending storm of arrows. But Arderic would have bet that his impetuous younger opponent, Alak, lacking discipline, mm. would lose patience. He was right. Mm. Some of the Hunnic captains began probing the Germanic line their charges at the shield wall met by jabs of spears coming mm. through the gaps. Elak could no longer control his troops, and a general attack began. The swift riders washed over the enemy line. Germanic footmen buckled, worn down from incessant arrow attacks. Mm. Cracks appeared in the shield wall, but Arderic and his captains steadied the men in sectors that were under pressure to prevent a rout. Finally, Elak and his household troops reached the melee, giving additional impetus to the attack. By now, both sides had no reinforcements left, and the battle devolved into a brutal slugging match. Yeah. Not for the first time, the Huns proved their mettle in close combat. Punching her. I mean, I don't know why anyone didn't at the time didn't think to go round these little leg areas and just come, try and get round to the to the sides and rear. Curious. Holes through the Germanic line, they had split them into three sectors. Mm. But before long, Alak's push to force the enemy to rout had exhausted his own men. Mm -hmm. The Hunnic charge finally broke against the Gepid shield wall, and a controlled pushback began. Mm. Some Hunnic riders broke off to bait the enemy, shooting arrows as they went. But Arderic prevented his men from breaking formation and giving in to a wild counterattack. Mm -hmm. Instead, the Germanic line pushed in shield wall formation waiting to receive the Hunnic riders coming through the lines to rejoin the fight. Mm. Arderic's men again held off the onslaught. The Huns again broke off, this time suffering heavier losses while inflicting minimal casualties. Mm. As a new wave of Huns was forming, Arderic shouted, Now! Mm -hmm. 
His men, desperate to draw enemy blood, dropped their shields and wow. rushed forward. That might have played into their hands. By now a semi-disorganized mass, Elak was unable to organize his lines. Mm. Faced with a solid line of Ardric's men charging at them, many Hunnic riders retreated. Mm. With the bit between their teeth, Arderic and his troops ran headlong after the retreating enemy. The Huns were driven back towards their camp, which Elak and his allies would have fortified with wagons mm. and attempted to find some shelter and a redoubt to stop the now rampaging Germanic warriors. The hope was that once night fell, the fighting would die down and they could retreat to safety. The Gepids and their own allies were familiar with the wagon wall tactic, and they would have made use of fire arrows, oil, yep. and other accelerants to burn their enemy from their. Yeah, if your shelter is made of, if your defense is mostly made of wood, and the enemies know to use fire, the enemies will most likely use fire against it to trap you in there. Improvised stronghold. At this point, the battle would have descended into the maelstrom described in the annals. The Huns firing their bows desperately from the flames, the Heroli light cavalry engaging in running battles with the slow-moving and exhausted heavy Alanic cataphracts. The Rugil and Zuevi used their spears to cut down any who tried to save themselves from the growing inferno that surrounded mm -hmm. the Hunnic camp. In the words of one chronicler, all of the nations tore themselves to pieces. In the end, Elak, the son of Attila, fell somewhere in the flames. Throughout the rest of the day and into the night, the Hunnic army was extinguished with losses in the tens of thousands. Yeah. The victory on the Nadao changed everything and nothing in the Roman wow. world. The younger sons of Attila, Ernak and Dengizic, abandoned the western edges of their father's domains mm. and moved back into the eastern fringes north of the Black Sea. There, their names and no doubt inherited capabilities meant they enjoyed long reigns, but they would never come close mm. to their father's success and infamy. Both the Ostrogoths and the Gepids carved out their own kingdoms, where the Gepids served mm -hmm. as a thorn in the side of the Romans for the next century, yep. until defeats inflicted by the Emperor Justinian I and other tribes yep. caused their gradual diminishment and eventual disappearance. Mm. In the west, the Vandal sack of Rome the year following Nadao led to the elevation of the short-lived Emperor Avitus. Mm. He managed to retake Pannonia for the Empire amid the collapse of the Hunnic realm, a much-needed source of manpower for the Roman army, reduced in its many wars and civil conflicts. It was, of course, too little too late. Three years later, in 457, Emperor Majorian made the last great push to restore the power of the Western Roman Empire. You can see that video here. Play War Thunder on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox using my link below. When registering using my link, there is a massive free bonus pack for new and returning players, including multiple premium vehicles, premium... And, uh, hang on. Okay, I just moved to the end. Collapse of the Hunnic Realm was not a spontaneous event, but a gradual process. Despite losing the Huns regrouped in the Eastern Europe where their rule persisted for the into the late 460s it is likely their nobility later merged with other steppe empires such as the Bulgars when when they crossed into modern-day Ukraine sorry just check out this other footnote it is possible that Attila's refused to elect a co-king after murdering his brother Bleda in 445 is what started a political crisis and ultimately led to the fragmentation of the Hunnic realm. After Attila's death in 453, moreover, it is possible Attila's sons rallied under Elak to preserve the Hunnic Empire. Now, split between the sons occurred only after Elak's death and the defeat 
in the defeat of the Nadal. So, uh, yeah. Just make sure there's no other. Okay. Sorry, I just had to make sure there's no other footnotes. So, uh. So, let me just take that off. And, uh, so that's been another interesting video from History March. And, um. And I uh, hope you enjoyed learning about about the about this subject and um I could have said that a better way but um so if you like this reaction please like comment and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video